Um, we so far have uh, eight participants here. Hello, Rena. Thank you for joining us. Hello. Hi. Thank you, Skip. Thank you. Uh, where Where are you from, Rena? I'm from India. Ah, oh. terrific. Yes, my, that's my motherland. Oh, yes. I didn't know. Bombay. Bombay. Yeah. So you were born in Bombay. Yeah, I, I come from Bombay. That's right. Oh, that's lovely to hear, Rand. Where are you? I'm I'm in Bangalore. Oh yes, yes, indeed. Of course, the IT center of India. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I have a colleague, Rena, who is together with me reading the uh, Bhagavad Gita right now on our oh, YouTube awesome. channel. I don't yeah. know if you're aware of that. I, I grew up on that, of course, stories from the Bhagavad Gita, yes. Right. So, um, right. Uh, Professor Kemat, I, I want to introduce you here uh, to... Uh, Tim Holmes. Tim is my partner on this activity. And um, Hello. We're, as we're uh, gradually adding people for the next uh, four or five minutes, um, I'm going to ask Tim to explain the origin of what we're doing here. And, um, and Tim is uh, internationally uh, known, uh, especially sculpture artist. Uh, who, among other things, was the first American artist to have a, a solo exhibition at the Hermitage in St. Petersburg. Oh, yes, yes, I've been yeah. there, indeed, yes. And that was uh, some 30 years ago, believe it or not. And, Which is when I was there, I think. <laughs> and and Tim, Tim and I are on opposite ends of the spectrum. I grew up through the Logos, uh, through um, Marine Corps, the law and an MBA program in mainly statistics. And uh, Tim has been a lifelong artist and uh, somehow we met in the middle. And so uh, Tim, without further ado, why don't you go ahead and talk about our, what we've been doing here. Well, Ann, thanks very much for uh, joining us today. It's gonna be a real pleasure to, to have you talk to us and Welcome the rest of you. Um, one of the things that has always disturbed me about our culture is that we've pretty much wiped out all of the rituals that human beings have learned how to develop. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I think is most troubling about that is we really have no way of addressing loss other than a funeral when a loved one dies. There, there is no way to, uh, to ritualize the losses that we feel anytime we lose a job or get divorced or have a terrible disease or anything like that. When you, when you experience a loss in this culture, you're on your own. And you, know, you can go out and get drunk for the weekend, but just make sure you get back to work on Monday morning. And I think this is really a cause of a lot of our angst today because we are a communal people. We are like bees in a hive. We depend on each other. And if we don't, if we don't address our mental health issues, is it any wonder that we end up with such trouble as we are seeing unfold in the US right now? Here's this pent up feeling of rage and disappointment that I think would, um, that I think is exacerbated by the fact that we just don't have a way of, of addressing our feelings in a public forum. So that's one of the reasons for the impetus in, in putting this group together is just giving us a way to, to contact other human beings who are, especially at this time, when the whole world is in sequestration, trying to address our frustration that the world has changed, it will never be the same again. And we, all of us have to grieve the losses that we feel, even if it's just a simple loss of lifestyle, which it, which it is for me. Um, as an artist, I've been sequestered for years, so that doesn't make a big lot of difference to me, but I miss human beings. And 
having this opportunity to talk to other people around the world that have similar stories. I'd like to hear what, um, what are you dealing with? What are the concerns that you have? What are the, the losses that you feel in your own life? So that's what this group is for. Okay. Thanks. Were you addressing me? Because I, I think I'd rather hear what other people's losses are. <laughs> Uh, because, um, it, like you, I'm fortunate uh, that I can do my work from home, and I had anyway for years been working online because so many of uh, patients and uh, analysands and supervisees uh, live outside the UK. Um, so actually, it's uh, you know it, I I rather welcome the lockdown because it's. Um, I, I continue to work as you try. I'm in touch with uh, obviously family and friends by uh, Zoom and Skype, and um, it's given me plenty of time to do to write as much as I I write all the time. So you know that's that's been a, a blessing. I am very aware, of course, that there have been a lot, so many deaths. I mean, in the UK, we have a lot, and I know you're having an awful lot in the US, um, which, uh, which that is, is terrible. Um, and uh, the, on the whole, I have to say that um, Patients and analysands have been bearing up pretty well because I'm in touch with people around the world every week and at a deep level, you know, we're, we're, we're doing analysis together and, and all supervision sometimes. Um, on the whole, people are really, I, I'm astonished at how uh, remarkably well people are holding up against this because, of course, China, which was the first place that, uh, that got hit by this. Um, I was in uh, several times a week in contact with China while it was going through the worst of that there. Um, and uh, helping, doing what I could, you know, online with people there because they were shot in. Uh, and then the, then the position reversed because then the UK <laughs> became uh, very badly um, affected by the virus, and they were then concerned about me. So we've been kind of, mute, you know, supporting each other through this. It's, it's been, thank God for technology is all I can say. I, I'm terrified by technology, but at the same time, I'm very th thankful for it because, it, you know, I, I feel so much in touch with people. It's, it's through, through what we're doing now, for instance, um, and with all of you. And, and with all my patients who, uh, you know, where we mean so much to each other, that, that, that's, that's been a blessing having, having Zoom and Skype. Yes, I think, especially for us older people, it's a lot easier than it is for young people. And Indeed. I'm, I'm very concerned about young people, especially like I've got a 17 year old niece and, and you know, that social uh, <laughs> milieu that is there their basic mode of operation is has been so disrupted and mm -hmm. i really worry that this is going to have a permanent impact on how yeah. they learn how to relate with each other yes i'm so i'm not smiling at you i'm smiling because there, there's my the symbol of my motherland the tiger <laughs> uh, it's just come up how wonderful how wonderful and i'm tiger actually in the chinese horoscope <laughs> okay, well, I should uh, I should go ahead and introduce you. Right. Yes. Uh, Anne oh, and, um, so um, today we're going to hear from Professor Anne Casement. She's a senior member of the British Jungian Analytic Inst Association, associate member of the Jungian Psychoanalytic Association, a member of the British Psychoanalytic Council. New York State like licensed psychoanalyst who worked for several years in psychiatry from the late 1970s. She chaired the UK Council for Psychotherapy, 1998 to 2001, served on the executive committee of the International Association of Analytical Psychology, 2001 to 2007, and on the ethics committee, 2007 to 2016 becoming its chair in 2010. She has lectured worldwide 
published several books and contributes articles and reviews to The Economist as well as to international psychoanalytic, psychoanalytic journals. Major publications are Carl Gustav Jung, 2001, Who Owns Psychoanalysis, 2004, nominated for the 2005 Gradiva Award, Who Owns Jung, 2007, and The Blazing Sublime, which is in press. She served on the Gradiva Awards Committee in, the, in New York 2013 and is a fellow of the Royal Anthropological Institute and the Royal Society of Medicine. She has a private practice in London. So thank you very much, Professor Kamat Caseman, for uh, joining us today. Uh, we're quite honored to have you here. And uh, I'm going to turn the floor over to you and, and uh, hopefully you will tell us something about uh, your essay, which appears in uh, Jung's Red Book for Our Time, Searching for Soul Under Postmodern Conditions, edited by Murray Stein and Thomas Arst, volume one. So. Uh, yes, I'll try and remember it. I, I meant to reread it this morning, but I've had such a, um, an incredibly busy morning that I, I, I hope I remember what I said in that essay because I write all the time. Yes. And so something I published last year or the year before kind of fades a bit from memory. <laughs> well, <laughs> perhaps I could help a little bit. Yeah, right? you, you, you summarized it. Now. Yeah, well, you were starting to, yeah. you, you began, you had three different parts. And uh, the first part um, was uh, about Cicero and comparing Cicero to Jung. That was part one, uh, part which included something about cyberspace. And um, part two is the myth of Romulus and Remus and uh, the Republic of Rome and the Catalan conspiracy and then Part three is Jung's quest for his soul. And one of the things you mentioned in here was uh, Richard Dawkins' comments about memes. Mm -hmm. And uh, so obviously we have a new meme that is uh, emerging right now in our part of the world, uh, which is, I can't breathe. And uh, so uh, I would love to have you comment on the impact of the internet and um, these memes and what it's all meaning for the world. Um, uh, comments on the, the internet, did you say? Well, uh, or, you know, the impact of memes, uh, you were talking about Caesar and, um, and his, uh, his favorite meme, which was Vene Vidi yeah and um, and Jefferson and Lincoln's all men are created equal and uh, Obama's yes we can and oh, yes. Brexit take back control and Trump's make America great again so yes yes I did um the, the, we tend to think that that is a, a modern phenomenon in what we call sound bites. But the, the reason I wanted to put in um, Caesar's uh, Wayne Weedy Wiki, which is uh, those of you who did Latin at school will know why I'm pronouncing it that way. Um, there was actually a pop song called Veni Vidi Vici when I was doing Latin at school. Which, uh, I remember my Latin tutor saying to me that I would get wrapped over the knuckles if I didn't pronounce it the correct Latin way. Um, so, the, you know, what we call sound bites or what Dawkins refers to as memes, I, I have a, lot, a great deal of liking and um, admiration for Richard Dawkins. I go and hear him whenever, whenever he appears at uh, various venues that I attend. Um, his, uh, he, he's really 
started off looking at genes and how you know what how we they contribute what they contribute to our evolution our evolutionary development and then he came up with this um, term memes because it's not just our genes that contribute to to our evolution it's also the you know popular songs or the kind of what you you know the what you just said which uh, you know this um, I can't breathe um, or what Lincoln um, my and I'm sure most people's fav much loved favorite president of the United States um, you know what he so many memes that he came out with actually from you know, all men are created equal, um, which I think he was actually in the Constitution. If you have to remind me, I, it's a long time since I've been in Washington, but I, uh, your Constitution, uh, there's such great people who contributed to that. It's a beautiful language. Um, Yes, what, what else would you want me to say about memes? Um, they, they stay with us. Um, and because, as I'm sure you all know, we can only hold so much information at any one time in our minds. So only, for instance, seven numbers. This is why telephone numbers are you know, just seven dishes. And so uh, although we think it's, you know, postmodern phenomenon that, uh, that people only remember sound bites, actually that, that's been true throughout the ages because we, we can't remember the whole of the Gettysburg Address, for instance, um, or some of Churchill's great speeches. Um, but we remember just some memes from them. And that 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 contributes enormously actually to our evolution as human beings yeah it's a, it's it's just a, a way to remember things i i'm looking back yep. now at um you know various books of the indian uh history and i know i am reminded as with ulysses and uh, the Odyssey that these uh, stories were passed down for generations through a uh, verse and imagery uh, so that we could remember things that had happened in the past. Um, well, you were talking about um, Cicero and Jung and about uh, Cicero's uh, role in the development of um, of Rome and his emphasis on um, the rational. And I, and I wonder if you'd compare Cicero to Jung in that way. Um, the, the, Cicero really is, if you like, an ancient Greek in, in Rome. And he's, he's there at a hugely important time in Roman history uh, when it's changing or it's tra transmuting, one might say, from um, a republic to an empire. The Roman Empire begins with uh, Caesar's nephew, Augustus, or Augustus as he became. Um, and the Roman Republic had um, uh, the huge uh, principles that it was based on. It, it was, a, um, one might almost say, a moral order. I mean, there was, set, you know, there's certain um, prescribed kind of behavior, modesty, for instance, humility, um, uh, and and it was, you know, democratic rule, the rule of law. Uh, was all important. Um, and then, of course, a lot, you know, they, they were big men, as we refer to them nowadays. They, they were big men who would appear every so often, because this lasted, for, the Republic lasted for several centuries. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not sure if this is quite what you wanted me to talk about, but I'm so fascinated by, by ancient Rome. 
Well, I think it's I think it's very uh, it's very significant what you were saying uh, in your essay about what happened to the republic and so on. These will yeah. be uh, what can and is happening in the United States yeah. right now politically, yeah. and and I'm interested in in the way Jung viewed history as the development of the psyche. And... Uh, did he? Oh, yes, I, I, I mean, I'm very, I, I've become increasingly interested actually in the way that the Hegelian uh, historical uh, perspective, because I'm, for many years now been very close to Wolfgang Giedrich, who is a Jungian psychoanalyst in Berlin. And so much of his thinking comes out of both Hegel and Heidegger, both of whom I've been making attempts to study. They're extremely difficult to comprehend, but Hegel particularly um, has a historical uh, view of um, human development. Um, and to some extent, one can uh, think of Jung's uh, alchemical uh, process as, you know, there's a dialectical process, just as Hegel, Hegel's view of um, uh, the historical development of human consciousness is. Um, and it, it, although Jung himself had no time at all for Hegel, but I think he, do you mind if I get into philosophy, which is- No, please, please go ahead. That's your door. I, I, you know, I'll keep it simple because I'm, I, I'm not a philosopher, but I, I've, I've always been very drawn to philosophy since I was 16, I think. Um, I, I, it seems to me that Jung had very definite ideas of which philosophers were his philosophers, like, and which philosophers were definitely not. <laughs> Hegel was number one on the hate list. Mm -hmm. um, he thought, but I think he gets a lot of his um, his opinions about Hegel from Schopenhauer. And Schopenhauer absolutely loathed Hegel because he absolutely worshipped Kant. And he he he, every, he can't he hasn't got a good word to say for Hegel. And I think Jung is rather following Schopenhauer there and saying, calling Hegel a pompous windbag. I mean, they're really being very rude indeed about Hegel. Uh, but there, there is nevertheless really quite a, an overlap, it seems to me, between Hegel's model, if I can go into this briefly, is sure. not the one that's usually touted, which actually comes from Fichte, and that's the thesis, antithesis, synthesis, because that always implies a kind of forward movement, whereas Hegel's dialectic is a spiral, and Jung's view of um, development is very much that spiral which I think either consciously or in some way he actually gets from Hegel, that we, for instance, we, um, we find ourselves in a certain position and increasingly we become, you know, dissatisfied with this of it. So we move to, shall we say, the next position. And, you know, it's got, it's, that also then begins to dissatisfy us. So we move to the next position where, again, contradictions in that position begin to dissatisfy us. And so we come back to the original position we started from. But of course, it's not exactly where we left it, because we've been through what Hegel calls so many negations uh, in that one spiral. And so that life is, uh, for Hegel, and I would suggest for Jung, and certainly for myself, is a kind of spiraling process. Um, and a slow distillation, a slow refinement of all the contradictions that that make up living for all of us. Uh, so that's briefly what I'm getting at with, um, at least trying, trying to address the point you made. Do you, do you, uh, um, do you attribute that in part to the, uh, the theorem of Maria, um, Maria Prophetessa, 
one one becomes two, two becomes three, and yeah. the third becomes the fourth, which is one again. Uh, yes, I, I, I'm just trying to see how that fits. I think so. Um, well, I, the way I I've the way yeah. I've seen it is, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. a man or a woman as one becomes two becomes a couple. Uh, th that's a thesis and antithesis, and yeah. the synthesis is a child. Uh, now mm -hmm. you have a third a, a third thing, which is a family, and that family then mm -hmm. um, may split and have another child, which again uh, becomes a bigger family, or um, it develops into something different as time goes on. That sounds a bit out there to me. Um, I would see that perhaps more as an internal dialectic. Um, in what in psychoanalysis we call triangulation um, and the resolution of uh, triangulating, which, which I see very often in, in people I work with psychoanalytically, um, that we start off from um, uh, it, it being narcissistic, if you like, in psychoanalytic language. I mean, we're you know totally bound up in our own little worlds when we first we first arrive, when we're first thrown into this thing called the world, uh, to use Heideggerian language and Lacanian language, um, and we're still kind of part, partially psychologically anyway in the womb um, and then slowly we begin to evolve out of that we come out of that primary narcissistic stage and then we we get we are in a symbiotic interaction with mother whoever or you know substitute mother um, and what is very much needed is the third because otherwise one remains stuck in, in a sim symbiotic, at a symbiotic level of development. And so if one remains stuck there, uh, the way that plays itself out in an individual's life is that they will keep searching for what we call adhesive ways of relating rather than um, more autonomous ways of relating to others or another. I'm, I'm speaking a different language too, but I think no, that, that no, that's quite all right. We're we're okay. uh, familiar with it to a certain extent. We have a question uh, from YouTube, which is, uh, what does Professor Casement think of archaeology and the inner goddess and the development of the anima? If not relevant, would you mind speaking of her own definition of the anima? Oh, wow. <laughs> that is one of, for me, um, that is one of Jung's great contributions to, to psychology. Um, uh, either, it, I've written, um, I've actually written quite a bit about, I don't separate out, by the way, um, on the whole, anima and animus. I, I very much look at them as a sissage, um which is, uh, I think, a Gnostic term originally. Uh, please correct me if I've got that wrong. Um, it, it's, but a t it seemed to me, I was tracing Jung's uh, own development of animal through his various writings. I think he writes about animal with the greatest passion than he does about any other of his concepts. He's, he, he is what I would call a really anima man. And he, he certainly lived it in many ways. I think certainly in, in, when he's a younger man through projection as you know, yeah, one tends to do when one's younger. Um, it, it's sometimes I will separate anima and animus because when they appear in dreams, um, we're sometimes dealing with, um, I, I give, I, I love working with dreams. This is one of the areas where I see myself very much in, in Jung, you know, in, in, in Jung's camp. I, I am, as I said to you, also 
there was called a developmental Jungian, which means I integrated a great deal of mainstream psychoanalytic thinking in the way that I function. But anima, the three things uh, are in Jung's metapsychology, if he would accept that as a uh, term for what he does, uh, that are for me absolutely vital in Jung's thinking. One is anima uh, and syzygy, both, but I, but I do think one can separate out anima at times. It, it, it's, I can't give too many examples, otherwise it would take the whole session. But um, the other is shadow, which I write about all the time. And I'm actually putting together five lectures that I'm doing for China in the autumn, all on shadow, also shadow and persona in some of them. And above all, perhaps alchemy. Uh, for me, the whole of life now is, is viewed through an alchemical lens. Um, life is an alchemical process, as I experience it. Uh, anima play, and I use, a, I've, um, as I say, I'm writing all the time, so I, I've produced a huge uh, presentation on alchemy in which I'm looking at anima, animus, um, as syzygy, but also in the interrelationship between um, analyst and analysand but then taking it back into each of them and seeing how each of them is integrating anima, animus in themselves. It's, it's you know, just a rough idea. All of the, those are probably the major things. There are other areas in which I put myself very much in the young camp, but there are those three of his, um, from his theoretical um, model are hugely important for me and always have been. Um, I don't know if I answered the, the question. Um, about well, uh, anima. I think that's uh, fine for now. We go into <laughs> anima quite a quite a lot in this group, <laughs> and uh, so others can uh, certainly refer back to some of our earlier uh, discussions. Right. When we when you and I first interacted, you mentioned that you were a different sort of Jungian, that you're from the London developmental uh, Jungians. And uh, so I wonder if you would uh, describe this distinction you're uh, talking about. And I, I noticed that you uh, had written some papers on the split in London of th four different Jungian groups. So I think it would be interesting for us to understand how those are split up. <laughs> okay, well, shadow, of course, is uh, <laughs> very much the forefront there. Um, yes, uh, Laura, where do I start? Um, the, yes, it, I can see why you're linking what I said about, uh, you know, being developmental, Jungian, because the splits, or the splits in London are to quite an extent along ideological lines. Um, the first split happened, I mean, it's ideological lines, but also personalities. So that the very first one back in the seventies, I've been in the psycho world since 1964. So I've witnessed a great many things. Um, including living through, um, there were the, what we call the Freud Wars, which I'm sure you're, you're, all, you're all familiar with, and particularly in the United States, there were huge, there were huge wars going on there. And the Jung Wars really had their first showing in London. And that was, uh, uh, when I was first around in the Jungian world, um, of course, I was still an ancient new, and, but I became, fairly quickly, I became aware that there were tensions. I used to go to presentations at the London Analytical Psychology Club. Um, and I could see, although I was still, you know, very young, both um, chronologically, but also in the movement in the psych psychological world, that there were tensions and there would be, you know, um, animated even, 
uh, quite uh, <laughs> um, aggressive uh, interactions between various members of the Jungian community. Um, and so by about, I'm just trying to remember the dates, I was asked actually by the Journal of Analytical Psychology for the 40th birthday issue to uh, write uh, a piece on the, the splits in the UK, the Jungian splits. Um, and so I went around and I interviewed all the major uh, participants in those splits, which happened in, the, uh, it started in the 70s and the word big split happened, I think, in 76. So uh, Gerhard Adler, who I, I, I was quite close to, had died by the time I got around to writing this piece, which would have been in, oh, it was about a year or two after Gerhard died, which would have been about 84, something like that. Michael Fordham was still very much around, so I spent some time with Michael and with various other, the main protagonists in, the, in, the, in that split. Um, and I wrote up a, 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 an article for the Journal of Analytical Psychology on the splits in the UK. It was pretty awful. Um, uh, they, they remained, uh, there were two splits, which then became three, because the initial splitters then split again. <laughs> and um, so back in the 70s and early 80s, there were three IAEP Jungian trainings. Um, that eventually became four, because the splitters <laughs> from the splitting, split off group then split themselves and eventually became five so actually in London uh, all based in London uh, although they are of course UK wide um, there are now five uh, IAP Jungian trainings um, based in London and a lot of shadow was around an awful lot of people got hurt. what finally began to shift things was the berlin congress which was one of the great congresses every three years the ia we have a, a, a an international congress and i think it was when was berlin 86 something like that to, uh, while berlin while berlin itself was split it was a fascinating time to be in berlin and 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 having um, a lot of the older Jewish analysts had nev never been back to Berlin from when they had to leave as children in the 30s. And so that was a very interesting time. And so quite a few of these people actually found themselves for the first time since they were children back in this place you know, that they had to flee for their lives from either to New York or London, you know, mainly USA and UK. Um, one of them was a very well-known New York an a Jungian analyst called Werner Engel. Werner Engel, I think should be pronounced. And I remember walking into the Reichstag with him because our first reception was at the Reichstag. And he said to me, I feel that I'm walking into the gates of hell. Mm -hmm. And I could, I mean, you know, I could understand what he was saying, although I'm not actually Jewish myself or have right. been around in the 30s. So um, uh, well, the reason I'm mentioning Berlin is because it was the president of the IAP at that time who was a Berliner, a very brilliant man called Hans Dietmann, who eventually said to London, to all of us, it's about time you lodge stop presenting your problems at every IAP Congress and it's about time you started to talk to each other. And of course he was quite right. So what happened was we developed what's called the Umbrella Group, the London Umbrella Group. And a few of us started meeting regularly. And we actually, I I've, I've, um, chaired or organized the first UK Jungian conference um, sometime in the 80s, uh, where all four at that time, all four of these uh, groups came together and put on a joint con conference. The first time they'd all actually gathered together under the same roof, which was very, very pleasing event. Yeah, you know, sounds like uh, the problems that are 
existent within the Protestant church. <laughs> but, and, and, anyway, uh, leaving that aside, there's some, uh, there are a couple of comments here uh, that are, wor are worth addressing. So I, I'd love to have you do that. Uh, John Clare says, in your essay, you were discussing the spirit of the times that Jung addressed. His experiences before the First World War. You note that in the Red Book, Jung reveals the acute awareness of the way world history repeats itself. How do you see world history as repeating itself in these times? How would you char characterize our spirit of the times and the spirit of the depths, is it possible to apply Hegel to the repetition and then see a new development? If so, what is the new development? There's more, but I'll leave it at that. Uh, for that's quite enough there, yes. Um, I, I'm, I'm not a, a prophetess. I can't see into the future, but yes, certainly it's very, very, very alarming uh, seeing um, the similarities, the acute similarities between what's going on now to what was happening in the 30s, in, in uh, particularly, of course, in Europe. Um, uh, very alarming indeed. And uh, Jung, uh, what, one thing which I, I, I two book, books of mine are currently with the publishers, uh, different publishers, of course. Um, where I'm actually addressing quite a lot of this. What Jung was, the really important contribution he made, I think, was to pick up on what he called the isms. At, at his time, of course, the main isms were fascism and communism. Uh, but he he makes it quite clear that these these are the two that he's mainly addressing, but that there are all kinds of other isms, including he, he interesting enough he includes liberalism. Um, any isms he said, you know, uh, are, he had a very negative view of, and I, I'm absolutely one with him on that. And what we're seeing is the extremes now. Um, happening all over again that we saw in the late, it started in like 20, back in 1926, of course, with the, with the rise of the Nazi movement in, in, in Germany. With, uh, uh, it was actually, as you know, Nazi means the, you know, the social socialists. Um, and so it, that eventually becomes not, uh, fascist. Um, the communists, on the other hand, I mean, there are huge battles in Germany between the communists and the fascists. Um, we're seeing, we're seeing uh, a lot of this being replayed. Uh, they may take different names now, but then the rise of big men, of course, um, as we saw in the 30s. Fortunately, big men who also were in a sense, saviors of the world. I'm thinking there, particularly, of course, of Churchill and President Roosevelt, um, the two great men of the 20th century. Um, yes, it's, it's, it's all seems to be repeating itself. History does, although not in quite the same way. We, we you know, we, this is why we can't uh, well, we'd be very unwise to predict. I'm not, given not just what's happening politically, but what's happening with the virus, which is a phenomenon that nobody expected and which is having devastating impact on, on everyone in the world. Everybody in the world is affected by this. Um, and we have no idea <laughs> what that's going to lead to. I mean, there are a lot of people, I think, are making predictions, which I, I, I'd never try and do, because, yes, maybe the, the world will be completely changed once uh, the virus begins to subside. Uh, who knows? The, the human nature, I have sense, never actually changes fundamentally. Um, the outer trappings might change a bit. Um, that that is, but of course, the initial impacts are going to be a, an awful, terrific impact on mental health. I, because I'm a, a fellow of the Royal Society of Medicine, I, I'm very fortunate in having weekly events, uh, at least once a week, if not two or three times a week, we have events put out by the Royal Society of Medicine, a lot of them to do with the impact of the virus, of course. 
and the men uh, the impact on mental health is unbelievably terrible. I mean, that's just in the UK, so let alone worldwide. One huge thing, of course, which we're forecasting is going to increase enormously is PTSD, for obvious reasons. Um, then there's the impact of people being incarcerated together, so that we get, as you know, I've heard uh, epidemiologists, I, I, I studied epidemiology myself at one time, so I'm very interested in epidemiology, but I've heard American epidemiologists saying the same thing in the US that we're seeing here, a huge increase in domestic violence of all kinds. Um, then a huge increase in the psychoses. I, I'm obviously very interested in that because I worked for many years in, in psychiatry. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the impact of this is, is enormous. It's, it's, it, it, and it's so, it's so out of the blue. Um, I wonder what Jung would have made of this. That would be really interesting to ponder, wouldn't it? What, what does anyone think you might have, might have made of this, uh, this yeah. invisible enemy, as it's being called? Yeah, what, what came to my, I mean, in terms of uh, psychology I, or psychiatry, I wouldn't venture to comment, but um, what came to my mind as you were talking there was Jung's statement that the one thing that gave him hope was the Western democracies. Do you have a thought about that? Um, well, he didn't, uh, he didn't experience 2007 to 2009. What happened there, uh, I mean, he's sounding a little bit like uh, Francis Fukuyama. And much as I admire Fukuyama, and I go and hear him speak whenever he's in London, which is fairly often, Fukuyama got it dead wrong. <laughs> you know, once we got hit by 2007-2009, I'm afraid liberal democracy took a, you know, a, such a severe blow. That it, you know, he, Fukuyama was essentially saying that that was it. That nothing, you know, communism was dead. Uh, liberal democracy now was, you know, that's all there was. This is the end of history, to quote Hegel. <laughs> this book is actually called that, The Last Man, The End of History. Yeah. Uh, uh, so I wonder whether Jung would still be saying quite the same thing about the democracies if he'd lived through that. And also Churchill himself, um, he said about democracy that it was the least worst way of governing, of governance. He, he didn't have any illusions about it being a wonderful, you know, democracy has its limitations like every other political system. Yeah, would you, would you say that uh, we're suffering in the United States through a major uh, collective neurosis uh, in terms of our pulling to the right or the left? I wouldn't dream of diagnosing a country. Well, I, do, I actually don't diagnose anyone outside, the, outside my consulting room, so I wouldn't use those words. Right. Um, it, it clearly, it, the United States is going through a deeply troubled time. It's, it's a re recurring issue. Um, I don't see how, I don't honestly, I can't see any resolution to this issue. Um, it, it, I, I really don't know what to say about that. It's, it's, I think it's more for you to tell me. Um, it's, it's, I, I, I'm very, very brought down by it, but it, it, it's, it does, it, it is, of course, a um, legacy of, um, as we know, from the 18th century. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, you, you, you all tell me, I, you know, I, I, I'd, I'd rather not make comments about the United States because I, I think that would be presumptuous on my part. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I can give my opinion, which is that the U.S. is self-correcting um, and it will self-correct, uh, although it will be bloody, as Jung pointed out in the Red Book. Uh, let me go back to another question from John Cla Jan Clare, or Jan Clare. Uh, in your essay, you quote Jung, quote, I must say that God could not come into being until the hero had been slain, 
the hero as we understand him has become the enemy of God since the hero is perfection. The hero must fall for the sake of our redemption. Quote, uh, the hero that is referred to in this context represents reason and yeah. the idealized consciousness of the times. Can you speak further on this idea of Jung's? Who or what is the hero in our times? Oh, there's so much in that question, heavens. Um, well, the hero in our times, I'm afraid, is money. Um, that's that's what everyone seems to worship now. Uh, that is the God, uh, and and uh, Mammon rules supreme. Uh, it, it's uh, and I think we're going to. I'm afraid we're going to see more and more of that uh, as the aftermath of the the virus uh, begins to unfold, because <laughs> money has become the supreme god that everyone worships are you know this is uh, and and we everybody's taken a, a huge hit from this virus uh, in, in financially not just in terms of health but also in terms of the economic health and well-being um, we're constantly in, with this virus what what we're up against the whole time is um health versus well-being um, it's a very difficult one. It's very difficult to square that circle because do we focus on the, he the actual health of individuals or do we focus on the overall well-being of the society in which they're embedded? And the two do not, you know, they, 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 they're, they're opposites really. If you focus on one, you then are going to have a lot more deaths, you know, and there are going to be a lot more deaths, whatever we do, that we have yeah. to face. Um, I just, I just yeah. uh, for, for bemusement, I want to share one thing that I okay. share with my group frequently, mm. which is this image. Um, this is a 64-foot motor yacht, mm. which is called Never Enough. Yeah. yeah. And it's symbolic of uh, the same thing that our... Um, mm our president is the poster boy for, which is uh, the God of materialism doesn't bring you happiness. Um, mm -hmm. and, indeed, yeah. And, um, that, that indeed, yes, yes. Um, happiness, uh, happiness is, um, I mean, it, that for me is not the main goal, if you like, in life. Um, because I think happiness uh, in one's lifetime, perhaps one can look back on moments of happiness, but um, I, I think contentment, um, being reasonably well in your skin, that, 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 that would be all I would aspire to, quite honestly. Uh, happiness is not something I've ever felt was, uh, was the loss of humankind, um, sad to say. Uh, but it, I'm just trying to remember what the, uh, the questioner was asking me. Um, could, could you just repeat some of that? Because there was a lot in that point that the somebody was making. Uh, yes, I will. Um, she says, in your essay, you quote Jung, yeah. uh, I must say that God could not come into being until the hero had been slain. Yes, yes. The yes. hero as we understand but, him. Yeah, can I just stay with that? Because there's no, you know, and that, and that is a very good one because what, what I was doing in that essay it, it was like the seeds of an idea. I'm an ideas person, essentially. This is what I really play with all the time. I, I love playing with ideas. I love grounding them. I mean, you can play with ideas forever, but you have to ground them sometimes. Some ideas can be grounded. Others, one has to let go of. It's just all there's to it. And what he's getting at there, and he makes it quite clear, and I've actually then elaborated that into a, another major presentation I did in Vienna, the Congress there last year, is that 
he, the hero, he himself was, uh, he had his hero and that was Siegfried, you know, this blonde um, uh, conquering hero, the, the, the ideal Teutonic hero actually. And in that all important dream vision, it's not quite clear to Jung whether it's a dream or a vision that he has where he and what I call his shadow um, come together to kill the hero. And it is Siegfried as he, as he approaches on his chariot and they kill him. And he, Jung, uh, to, at the end of that vision or dream, um, then is in floods of tears. And what he, he says, I have to understand this because, you know, I've done a terrible thing. Why have I done this? I have to be able to understand why I have killed this beautiful hero. And he says, the, then he begins to realize that the tears, you know, washing away this old, you know, the old hero worshiping, and that has to go before the new God can come into being. And that's basically what he's getting at. And I think that's quite an extraordinary revelation for him. Right, and uh, she goes on with the quote to say, the hero, the hero that is referred to in this context represents reason and yeah. the idealized consciousness mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. times. Mm -hmm. Very much so. Um, but I'm not sure there's ever been a time where reason, I, which is why I uh, was writing the essay in the first place, which was, you know, the Cicero represents, I adore Cicero, he's, <laughs> I, I just I loved him since I started on Latin when I was at school. Um, the, the, there's everything, everything about him is, is I admire, but I do also I have a, the major criticism I have of Cicero is that he himself worships reason. That for him, reason is God. And he's getting that, of course, from, from Athens. He goes to Athens a lot. He's basically, a, he's basically an Athenian, an ancient Athenian rather than an ancient Roman. He doesn't really fit that well into Rome. He, he is much more of a philosopher and a deep thinker and an orator like they were in Athens. Uh, when, as in Rome, as you know, the, what's, what's the, the gods that are worshipped in Rome are power, military might and money. Uh, whereas in Athens, it's knowledge and it's reason. And Cicero worships reason. And so even when he, his beloved daughter dies, which is the biggest blow that could happen to him in his whole life, because he didn't love many people, but she was, she was his anima, if you like, to use our language. Um, when she died, he, he has a you know, complete breakdown, really. And then he starts to turn his attention to religion. But the way he does it, again, is through reason. It's, it's uh, for him, he can never, whereas Jung realizes that he actually has to let go of the old consciousness, of the old reason that, you know, the identification with this uh, blonde Teutonic uh, hero. You, you, and I, you and I had a uh, exchange about Jordan Peterson. Oh yeah. And, um, and so without going into that yet, I, I'd like to just ask you for your um, comments and then. Uh, about uh, Peterson, um, he, uh, when I first heard about him, I, I, I was full of admiration because of his courage. I mean, there's no doubt about it, he's a courageous man. And he stood up to that, the worst sort of bureaucracy really. Um, uh, bureaucracy, oh goodness, what the one, one needs bureaucracy and at the same time it, it, it strangles life really when it gets too much. Um, and so initially I had very positive uh, feelings about him, particularly as he 
was raising the, he is, as you know, an academic, he's a professor of psychology. He was raising the profile of analytical psychology and of Jung in, in the academy, which was incredible. So I was, I thought this is, this is marvelous. I, I was all for him. Then I went to see him when he came to London. He, um, he put on an event here and I didn't care too much for what I saw there, which was a lot of young people basically um, turning him into a, a sort of godlike uh, leader that they could hero worship, basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he, um, his 12, the book of, you know, 12 rules or whatever it's called is, is so facile. And I began to realize his scholarship is, is actually pretty facile. It's, it, he's not a deep thinker. He uses, he's obviously enamored of Jung's archetypal approach, which, you know, how can one not be? Because it, it is so fantastic. But he's using it rather, I think, to his own ends. And he's becoming, he's beginning to identify with his own image. But I, I experienced here this kind of worshipping of him which was a bit sickening actually seeing him here. So I've got, you know, I still like, I think, still think he's, as you and I, ex when we were exchanging views about him, I said, I still, you know, think he's a force for the good, but with a lot of reservations now. Uh, <clears throat> well, I think uh, he represents the father figure that about half of all young men have and yeah. have as yeah. they're growing up. But at the same time, um, he name drops Jung a lot based on mm. Jungian memes, based on quotes from Jung. Yes. Um, and I, so that makes people think he's Jungian. And I, I, had, to, I had to correct uh, uh, a pastor who got quite fascinated with, with Jordan Peterson named Paul Vanderclay uh, when he and I spoke because um, Paul seems to think that he's Jungian. And I said, no, he's actually the opposite of Jungian. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I pointed out that the first two paragraphs of, um, of the Red Book explicitly say I had to give up all, all that logos, all that wonderful scientific knowledge and approach and uh, look to, to the irrational. And so anyway, I want to go to another uh, question uh, yeah. from the group here. Um, this is from Brendan Wall. Skip, I'm disappointed Dr. Casey says that human nature doesn't change fundamentally. All this current talk is quite depressing. The Dalai Lama and others have said the world is becoming more human. Uh, do you care to comment? We're living in a post, the post-human age, I'm sorry to say. Um, it's, uh, that's where we are. I don't know about more human, I would say probably less human. Um, I, we're living in an age increasingly of AI and machine learning. And we've got to get used to that because that's, that's here. Um, Mm, did I, I actually went to, I, my economist pass is wonderful. I can get into anywhere, frankly. So when the Dalai Lama was here a few years ago, I, I used my economist press card and I got into, and I sat with all the, the other media people, all of whom had very sophisticated technology and I had my little writing pad and pencil. Um, but at first I thought, he just spoke a lot of platitudes and I got, I, I was very disappointed in him. And then the, we were allowed three questions from the audience, uh, one of which inevitably was about uh, China, as we, I'm sure you all know the situation there between China and Tibet. Um, and suddenly there was a different man speaking and he spoke you know, the, 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 the earlier stuff was so platitudinous. I, I really, it was like listening to Jordan Peterson nowadays. Um, but then he actually became much more incisive and was very critical of China. Um, um, and I, you know, it, it, what am I addressing here? Can you just remind me, Skip? I think okay, I'm yes, he said, 
I'm disappointed Oski. that you say human nature doesn't change fundamentally. Uh, no, it, 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 it doesn't, but um, I'm not it, it, up to now. I, I, from now on, I don't know because um, AI and machine learning are going to bring about huge, and already are bringing about huge changes, of course. Um, I, one member of my family is very immersed in all this, so he, I'm being tutored a bit in cybernetics, and uh, I, I, I'm not a scientist, so I, I have great difficulty in understanding quite a lot of this language, but that's where we're going. So I don't know about becoming more human, I'm afraid not. <laughs> Yes, Brendan, you're... you're I'm maybe... sorry, I'm trying to ask, where is hope? Is there any irrational hope outside of me? Or is it just, am I the hope? Tell me. Is each individual the hope? Oh. Or is there hope outside of us? For a better world? Um, my initial response is no, um, uh, to be honest. Um, I also, could I, can I address that as a psychoanalyst? Because let me put it this way. Um, every patient or an Avizan that I see, I have, I make quite sure that my hope isn't getting into the work, um, if, if you follow me. Uh, the, the worst thing a, a psychoanalyst can do is to hope for a patient. Um, I'm not saying that we, <laughs> that we sit there being just pessimistic. I actually have, I, I get a lot of um, emails from the IPA. I'm on their mailing list for reasons which are not of any particular interest at the moment. But um, I, so I tuned into an IPA event. There were four senior, um, I'm not sure if they were Kleinians or contemporary Freudians, but or, or independence, but they were each from diff a different part of the world. And um, I got so depressed listening to these four that I eventually had to switch it off because it seemed to me that, um, it, 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 can I, I'm gonna speak very honestly here. It seems to me that psychoanalysts of whatever persuasion are the most depressed, hopeless people around. Um, you know, they'd have, I mean, I don't know what, what the heck goes on with most of my colleagues, but you know, if you listen to, to psychoanalysts talking, you think the end of the world is just around the corner. Uh, you know, it really is awful. So what on earth are they feeding into, into the people who come to them for, you know, for help? Um, it, I mean, it got to the point where I thought I'm going to commit suicide if I go on listening to these four. So I switched it off and I put on a good old Hollywood movie and that perked me up no end. I find Hollywood movies very, very, they fill me with lots of joy. I, I, I'm, I'm a joyful person rather than a hopeful one, I would say, Brendan. Okay. Thank you. So can you explain so what you mean by hope being the worst thing? Yes, I'll tell you exactly what I mean. Um, if I hope for something when, when a, a patient comes to me, I'm pushing me into that patient. Uh, I, I really, as far as humanly possible, to use the word that was used earlier, as far as humanly possible, I try and do away with any hope I have for that patient. Because if I, if I start hoping, I mean, people come, you know, with the most terrible, I'm sure I'm, I'm, sure I'm talking to a lot of practitioners here, so you know exactly what I mean. They come with the most terrible stories and you think, how on earth has anyone survived this? And what, what does the present and the future hold for this person? And um, then they, a dream will appear and my goodness, dreams are miraculous. And something else shows in a dream. Now, that's not my hope. That is something in that, per in that other person that has, if you like, hope. I mean, we know, we know Pandora's box and the last thing that came out was hope. Um, I, I guess, um, let me put it another way, um, to use Freudian language. I think we all have to live with a certain amount of denial. I, for instance, I don't think we can every day sit down and say, I'm going to die soon, uh, bec you know, because that really would make us feel, you know, like going off and jumping under a, a bus. <laughs> um, 
so to, to a certain extent, it, it's not quite the same thing as hope, but yes, I think we all live with a certain amount of denial. But hope is something I, I actually don't particularly place a huge amount of... Um, so, uh, uh, uh -huh. Leonard, Leonard Kaiser uh, asked a question, and then yeah. I'm going to open it up to the panel. Um, he says, <laughs> Uh, since the father of Siegfried is Sigmund, yeah. and he mentions him in Red Book after he had just broken with Freud, what is the relationship of, if any, of Oedipus and Siegfried myth to fallen here of fallen heroes? Oh gosh, yes, that's a huge one. Uh, Siegfried. Um, oh gosh, that myth is so fantastic. Uh, um, Oedipus and Siegfried. Um, how do they? Uh, yeah, the both. I mean, both these uh, myths are hugely important for the development of psychoanalysis, um, as we know, obviously, with the Oedipus myth. Um, Siegfried was clearly very important to Jung when he was young because as you know his the fantasy that he lived with uh, Sabina Spielrein was about this child this infant they would have and it was going to be called Siegfried it was the child was going to be of a Jewish Aryan union because Spielrein is Jewish and he's uh, Jung is Aryan um, and uh, but for Jung, that was symbolic. For Jung, that was an internal union. Uh, this is what I think he's getting at. This is what I see alchemy is about. It's about an internal, the, the, the real union is an internal one. It, we, have to, we have to live it partially through projection, otherwise we'd never get into life, would we? But eventually, one has to take that back into oneself and see the Siegfried. Um, this is when he's a young man. As I say, what happens later, as, as you know, is that he has to kill the hero. He has to kill Siegfried. Um, for Freud, I mean, for Freud, it's Oedipus, and as you know, the that is the. Um, you know, the myth of psychoanalysis. Um, and for Freud, I think that has special resonance because he is the Oedipal child for his, for his mother, for Amalia. Um, and Freud, Freud, um, he, he can't touch that because he, he never really analyzes, you know, the, feminine psyche. His, his um, psychoanalysis is very much geared to castration, anxiety, father, son, uh, father killing son or son killing father, um, depends on which one prevails in that particular struggle, uh, for access to mother, of course. Um, and so for Freud, the Oedipus myth is, is the one that, that, you know, dominates his personal psychology and he then you know becomes the the symbol for the whole of psychoanalysis. Professor Casement, um, it it has struck me as a layman. I, I'm an informed yeah. layman in the sense that that I've studied Jung for quite a long time now, 33 years, but mm -hmm. um, what strikes me is that um, the hero myth is really about uh, coming of age. In other words, the hero is the young person who reaches adulthood and maturity. And, and uh, the her heroic act is to become mature. And um, the, ex the archetypal example would be the first Star Wars movie, episode four, in which um, Luke Skywalker at the end is the hero and he's still a, 
a young man in his mid twenties, let's say, and he marches into the auditorium and there's a throng there and he's given this great award. And, and so then, uh, so then what? Okay, so in other words, the hero's journey is really um, about the first half of life. It's about becoming a human being because when we're born, uh, we're wild animals and we, only, we have to model our parents initially. And then gradually we learn to become a human being. But then when we reach maturity, um, then, then what? And that's when the midlife crisis comes, it seems to me. And, and my other thought on the Oedipus side is that Oedipus is not about wanting to have sexual relationship with your mother. It's really about um, fear of going out into the wild world. It's, a, it's actually about um, wanting to stay in the nuclear family because then you don't have to face uh, the, the cold, cruel world uh, that a mature person has to face. And I, I welcome your comments on those two um, ideas. Yes, thank you. That's, that's very interesting. Actually, I, I was kind of just, it, it, largely, I totally agree with uh, your first uh, point on uh, Siegfried, shall we say, on the hero. Um, what that, it's, that's all important, actually, the hero, because um, another concept of Jung's, which is hu hugely significant, is that of the pua puella, the uh, eternal youth. And in order to develop very much what you were saying, Skip, uh, into uh, manhood and womanhood, the, the poor Puella has to achieve something. And that is an, a heroic thing to do. Otherwise, you remain forever this, you know, little boy, little girl. And so you you have to risk things like the hero does. And there's something the Puad Puala can't do because they're always terrified of failure. That's that's on the Zifri side. On the uh, Oedipus side, actually, I slightly diverge from what you're saying there, Skip, which is the real, what he's, Freud's really getting at, uh, the core of psycho of that kind of psychoanalysis is the castra is castration anxiety. It's all about father son. Um, so that um, Oedipus has to kill the father because otherwise, the, I mean, the father tries to kill him at, at birth, as you know. And Oedipus then has to kill the father in order to become his own man. But then, of course, marries. He doesn't know that he's doing that, but he has uh, sex with his mother, produces children, then um, Tiresias, the wise old man, who's uh, the wise old man is a hugely, hugely important concept in Jung psychology, hugely important, one of the great ones uh, of, of all of his concepts. Um, so for me, it, it, uh, what Freud's getting at is really about castration anxiety. That, that is what drives um, the, the, you know, the male. Uh, for, he, does not, he doesn't try and analyze uh, the female psyche at all. He, he's, uh, partly because of his mother complex. I mean, he's hugely into his mother and she's a very young woman when she has him. She's, he's her darling. He's a total, she absolutely worships uh, uh, her son. Um, and they, I think that that relationship never, you know, he, he talks about the females as the dark continent, the feminine psyche, he doesn't try and go there. So it, it, it's very male orientated. What Jung does, of course, is to bring the mother in center stage with his early work, which is called, the original work is called Symbols of Transformation. I've written a whole lot on that recently. Um, it then gets translated in the United States as um, um, Psychology, uh, Psychology of the Unconscious right. by Beatrice Hinkle. Um, it then reverts back to its original title, Symbols of Transformation. What, and the real patient in that is Jung struggling with the mother complex and the twice-born, the Hindu twice-born 
how we're born biologically, but then we have to be born psychologically. And that's basically it in a nutshell. So the emphasis on a classical Freudian psychoanalysis is on father-son. In Jung, it's on mother son and, and being born psychologically from the mother, separating out from the, the all devouring mother, the Kali. Yeah, Inter interesting that you say that because I always thought it was a father complex because I'm, I have focused more on the later writings of Jung, yep. which are re obviously related very heavily to religion and Christianity, yep. uh, which was, uh, you know, maybe, maybe that is the killing off the father, I don't know. But we, ha we have some other uh, psych psychology. I, I, I could say some more about father and Jung because I then, what I say um, is uh, what I said just now about him, you know, the mother having to separate out from her. He is, with, with his father, his father's a huge disappointment to him. And it's, uh, it's, it seems to me that, that fathers, fall into two basic kind of prototypes, if you like. One is the castrating father, the all-powerful one, and the other is the absent father, whether he is there physically, he's still absent psychologically and emotionally. And, and this has a huge impact on, on you throughout his life. And, you know, he, the father's a minister, just as Nietzsche's father's a minister, there's huge overlap between Jung and Nietzsche, of course. A uh, lot in common, um, but it is, so that, yes, father features hugely. But I think that he first has to be born out of the mother complex before he can begin to tackle the father one, which is what he's doing basically with alchemy. Um, he the relationship with Freud breaks down because he's projecting the idea of his father into Freud. Freud's not having it. I mean, basically, Freud tells him to push off in the end. And so over and over again, he keeps, you know, and his, uh, I think it's Bennett who said about him, uh, Jung never developed a really satisfactory relationship with any man in his life. And so I don't think he ever really works through that father thing. But alchemy is about as close as he gets to it. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. Interesting. So I, w I wanted to just say that we have yeah. uh, several other psychologists right. here oh. with us today. Wow. I thought and so. I, I thought and I'd love to hear whatever yeah, other sure. questions are out there. Yes, yes. Um, uh, yes, I'm sorry if I go on rather well, but you know, these are highly complex questions you're throwing at me. So I can't just do quickie <laughs> meme, yeah. meme responses. <laughs> okay. We're, we're talking to Professor Ann Caseman, who's written quite a number of books on these topics. <laughs> so, so uh, we urge you to uh, go and uh, read her books. Um, oh, you want me to mention one or two? Um, can I mention the two that are in press at the moment? Sure, sure, please. One is, uh, it's got a very complicated title, which the publishers actually gave us, and that's Thresholds and Pathways Between Jung and Lacan. And the underlying motif is the blazing sublime. Um, uh, and that's with uh, Routledge at the moment. We, they are hoping to publish it in September. The other is one I've just sent to the publishers, and that's called The Analyst's Guide to Jung. And that's a brand new publishing house in, in the UK. And they asked me if I would do a, a, a new introduction to Jung, because I did one about 20 years ago. Um, and I've had great pleasure working on, on, on both those, actually. But um, so those, those are what are preoccupying me at the moment. I'm also about to launch into another book, which is for Texas A&M, and that came out of the Fay lectures, which I did there last November. Mm -hmm. And that's all on shadow. It's all in shadow. Yeah. Um, well, the third part of your uh, essay here. Right. Uh, in in the Jung's Red Book for Our Time uh, series is uh, Jung's quest for his soul, and um, I, I'd love to have you comment on what it is he's questing for because I think um, you know soul is sort of a disconnect, especially 
for many American um, men who have sort of lost touch with, with the, the beauty of the religious um, sensibility, let's say. They, we've, we've been cut off by the scientific method uh, all the Christian myths have had holes punched in them for the last 500 years. And, uh, and so, so then what do we do and what is it that we're looking for? Okay, well, the soul, um, the way that Jung and the way that James Hillman and the, uh, the somebody I was, became very close to in the last few years of his life and the way that Wolfgang Giegerich uses it, um, this that actually comes out of Thomas Hobbes, uh, 16th century philosopher. Um, what Hobbes was getting at there, it, at one time, the mind was called Plato and, and co, or talked of mind as soul. What Hobbes does in the 16th century is to separate out mind from soul. Um, because as science is beginning to develop, he says, you know, we can't talk about the soul anymore. He, he Hobbes says, this belongs in e ecclesiastic circles, whereas mind, we can actually study, and we can't study, scientifically study the soul. So we just put that in, you know, in the ecclesiastics, and we keep the mind, which is something we can study scientifically and develop. And so this is where um, I think Jung is, you know, that's why he's using the term soul, because uh, I don't think he's using it necessarily in, in a just strictly religious sense, but he's saying there's more to mind than there's something we can study scientifically. Um, the, the, uh, I mean, the, the loss of, if you like, religious, um, sentiment goes back really a long way. Um, it goes back to science. You know, once we start, yeah, totally. you know, once we separate, once philosophy starts to devolve into diff different disciplines, um, and, and science separates out from philosophy, and particularly at the Enlightenment time, as you well know, um, it's um, it, 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 we, you know we're beginning to question. God, we're beginning to question the church as authority. Um, we're beginning to question everything to do with the you know, so-called religious world. Um, right, but then we've lost we've lost connection with the spiritual side of life. We we become a, a ton of automatons, I think. Well, yes, the pro the pro the real problem I think there is that what we've lost are the containers. We, you know, we, we've lost, uh, the church was a container. Um, and once you lose that, yes, uh, the, 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 you know, all kinds of things, uh, you know, all, all kinds of things come out of the woodwork. Where do we, there, there is no doubt about it, we're born with original sin. So we are faulty creatures. We know that right from the word go. Um, where do we, for, you know, where do, how do we contain all that, you know, that killer side of ourselves, all those negative impulses, all that aggression, which is there. Uh, the church at one time acted as a container for all that. It gave us rules that we could live by. But what we've moved from is, you know, philosophy used to be all about morals, telling us how we could live a good moral life. That, does, that hasn't existed for centuries. Um, that then moved to what do we know, that moved to the emphasis on cognition from Descartes onwards, as you all know. And then in the 20th century, it moved to language. Where, where you know, where's moral philosophy anymore? You know, tiny little groups may study ethics and morality, what Lena was saying to me earlier, that we were discussing ethics apparently when we met. Um, where, you know, where do those belong? Uh, there, there's no, overarching container for them. So we are having to develop, you know, for instance, the IEP only in the last less than 20 years started to develop an ethics committee. 
um, everywhere we go, we run up against this problem of what do we do? You know, where's, where are our guidelines for leading a moral life? They're, they're not, you know, they're not there anymore. We either have to find them by looking inside ourselves, which is rather a lonely thing to do. Um, but they, you know, there isn't a, a really satisfactory or satisfying um, container out there for, for all kinds of, um, uh, you know, the problems of life, the what do we do with our bad side, how do we lead a good life, and so on. It seems to me that what Jung basically said was that you have to have this experience in order to understand how to how to differentiate. I mean, he was very uh, he he very often quoted First um, John four one which is examine the spirits, whether they be of God or not. And if, if you don't believe in God or you don't think there's anything there, there's only, there's only logic and so on, then uh, you're not going to have any clue what that means. And so Jung and Edward Edinger were very much about saying that, um, you know, there's knowledge that's been provided to us by science, but there's also experience and, and nothing psychological can be understood without experience. Um, and it's there where the spiritual side resides. Um, and one of the tasks of individuation is to connect with that. I suppose so. It's, it's not a word I use, actually, individuation. So perhaps somebody else can take that one up. Um, I, I, I mean, if God is dead, then everything is possible. I mean, basically, you know, the Nietzschean message of the 19th century um, leads to that obvious conclusion. If there is no God, you know, what are the breaks on human behavior? Yeah, but my, my take on it is that what Carl Jung did was, yes, God is dead in the sense of Nietzsche because the God as it was sold by the Christian church for 2000 years was full of holes, okay? And, but what Jung did was he found the living God, where that living God lives, and how the living God goes about doing the work of the Godhead. And that's my interpretation of the essence and importance of what he has done for, from a cultural perspective. I'm not talking about a clinical mm -hmm. psychology perspective. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um... Yeah, I've got, I mean, I was just trying to remember, I, I've written quite a bit on that. Um, and I can't bring it to mind at this moment. Um, he, uh, I, yes, throughout life he's struggling with this. And I think everybody does in different ways. Um, is there something greater than me kind of question? Um, Truly. You know that that that's what I think the majority of people ask themselves. You know, if it's just me, then then I can do anything because you know that that that, yeah. that kind of atom, atomistic thinking. Um, it's I, I have addressed this, and I'm trying to remember what I said about it. Um, yes, Jung fundamentally, what I have to say to. Because I, I lecture in, in many different cultures. I lecture quite a bit in the Far East and, and, and in other parts of the world. And I say, um, Jung fundamentally is coming out of a Christian Western background. One has to realize that because, you know, the, the, although he's interested in other religions, his real struggle is with the Christian God. 
and the way that it's been taught and reproduced over the centuries. Um, I mean, he's not struggling, you know, with uh, fever, he, you know, or... Um, well, it, it, it's interesting. Recently, uh, yeah. I've, I've been drawn to uh, the Bhagavad Gita, mm -hmm. thanks, thanks to a conversation we had with uh, Ashok Beatty. And, yeah, right. yes, yes. and uh, on page 154 of, uh, of uh, the Red Book, uh, where Jung has the image of Philemon, right next to it, he has the quotation from uh, the Bhagavad Gita, which Ashok Beatty referred us to which was the, um, was that when times of iniquity arise, that's when I manifest myself, uh, basically. But, and, and so basically the Bhagavad Gita is a manifestation of Brahman the, uh, or Vishnu and um, it's, well, it's Krishna, isn't it? Um, in, in, yeah, which is a manifestation of, of God, of, of the one. And, and Philemon is Jung's Krishna, it seems to me. Uh, Bhagavad, Bhagavad Gita means song of God, as I'm sure you know. Uh, and it's a wonderful dialogue between Krishna and Arjuna. Wonderful, wonderful piece. I love it. It's a, a piece of poetry, really. Um, and that is an internal, I, I mean, I'm back to what I was saying earlier, that really, you know, one takes everything back inside oneself eventually, and the real struggle goes on internally. Yes. You know, there's a God out there, then, you know, we can worship all kinds of things as gods. So, um, it's, it's kind of, what... There is the, again, back to, uh, I mean, I was brought up on the Bhagavad Gita and, and the Ramayana and uh, the Mahabharata, um, the, the stories from those, which, uh, as well as, of course, I mean, I'm, I'm British Indian, uh, as well as the, the, the usual stories that one gets in the West. Uh, so, I, you know, the, the, the dialogue that, that goes on between Krishna and, and Arjuna, I think, is just absolutely... I don't know if we have anything in the West that's uh, as beautiful as that. Yeah, you, it's absolutely what? You, you said it's absolutely, but... Um, it, for me, it's the most beautiful dialogue I think I've ever come across. I love it. I go back to it whenever I can. Um, because that is what goes on internally throughout life, really. Yeah, it, it so happens that I have uh -huh. uh, I have uh, the study guide to the Bhagavad Gita here uh, yeah. with me, yeah. and uh, by Les Morgan, and I turned to the end of uh, Les Morgan's book, and he provides um, theme guides for the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, and I don't think less in any sense of the word would regard himself as Jungian, but nonetheless, mm -hmm. the 11 themes that he discusses mm -hmm. in the back of the of this book um, are essentially the high points, the, the main ideas of Jungian psychology right down the middle, as oh. far as I can see. Uh -huh. And um, sounds a bit like Jordan Peterson's 12 Rules of Life. Uh, in, in what sense? Well, I, I don't know what rules you're, you're, you're talking about there, but um, no, it's he, themes, it's not rules. He's, themes, he's, uh, yeah, okay, but uh, Peterson's Rules of Life all seem to me to be fairly self evident, but um, you know, like bring up your children not to be a pain in the neck. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, they are good as much as it is for society's good, and of course that's very true, right. uh, and so on. Um, so uh, uh, let me just ask again: Are there any yeah, other yeah. questions from the from the group uh, that I uh, would 
you'd like to speak up and ask a question. Uh, and meanwhile, Professor Casement, uh, I'll be happy to add any of your books uh, in- uh, Brendan wants to ask a question. Uh, do call me Anne, by the way. I, I, you know, I, I'm, everybody calls me Anne. Yeah. So. Just, oh, just what I wanted to say, though, was that I, I'll be happy to um, oh, cool. add the names of your books in the description of this video on YouTube. Um, but OK, Brendan, go for it. And I'm extremely enlightened by your comment about God, that you basically, if God is dead, then there are no breaks to a yeah. uh, human um, being. And I love the fact what you're saying is that um, God has basically controlled culture. Well, God is what we use as the last word to control culture. If we could all be uh, a bit more um, atheistic or uh, a bit more objective in some way, do you think there's a, a greater or lesser potential for um, hu the human evolutionary process? without the breaks i'm saying let's get rid of god well certainly humanists would say that wouldn't they they'd say you don't need this uh, you know uh, super <laughs> superhuman being called whatever you call it god or anything else um uh, that yeah the living it, a bit like jordan peterson's 12 rules you know if you lead a decent life uh, that should be enough for anyone, <laughs> but but it's for me. It's kind of misses something, you know. Yes, okay, one can aspire to being a you know decent enough human being, but uh, it, 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 I my own view of humans is that we're made up of three parts. One is human. No, let's start from the beginning. One is animal. The other is divine. And the one that brings them together is human. Um, and I think if any one of those dimensions is missing in life, then something, something really big is being left out. And what do you define as the divine? Oh, yes, quite. Now that would take a whole session, actually. I think we'd have to explore that one together. Um, but it, it, an American friend of mine, it, I hadn't realized that this is my favorite adjective. And an American friend of mine eventually was started parroting me and saying, and that's a really divine dress you've got on this evening. <laughs> I <realized laughs> that I actually use it a lot. And so clearly, it's some, I, I mean, I, I really mean that, actually. I think we are those three things. And, a, and to be a whole person, is integrating those three into a whole, W-H-O-L-E. Mm -hmm. And if one leaves out one of those dimensions, then, yeah. then, then one's in trouble, basically, as, as a human. So, but the, the divine has to be there in some form. Whatever name one gives it, for me, is divine. Um, I, but I also do talk about God, yes. Um, it's, I, I mean, that's the reason, one of the reasons I stayed actually in the uh, Jungian so-called world rather than, uh, I thought at one time of training uh, in, at the Institute of Psychoanalysis uh, for various reasons. I've shifted so much to the mainstream psychoanalytic way of functioning as a clinician. But it's the divine that kept me in the Jungian world, and that is all important. And it's not there in in the in the mainstream psychoanalytic world. The little bits of it. My um, namesake, Patrick Casement, who is a family member. Um, Patrick actually is. He sent me his latest book, and it's called Credo. The question mark. Now, in the Catholic, for high mass in Catholicism, the credo for me is the most, it's all, a lot of it is sung in Latin, and the credo is the most beautiful part of, of Latin high mass. And I said to Patrick, goodness, I didn't realize you were Catholic, and he said, no, I'm not, but I am a questioning Protestant, which I thought was sort of wonderful. Um, and so for, that, that is, in a nutshell, how I see us, you know, that those three essentials have each to have 
you know, equal living space. I really yeah. agree with that. I think that's a beautiful <laughs> assessment. Thank and, you. and it seems to me that, that one of the things that we're dealing with is that the a majority of human beings, at least in the in the world that we see in the media, are are devoted to the divine of money. Yeah. And that's just simply not a big enough God. And that's why we're having yes. all these problems. And I think one of the reasons why there's the, uh, the crisis of the soul is because at yeah. some level, we know yeah. that money yeah. is not a big enough God. Absolutely. We're just, we're just so- that, that is a false God. You know, yeah. if money, that is a false God. And because all of the real estate in the religious world has already been taken up by fundamentalists, there's yeah. very little space left for a kind of uh, journey into the center of one's being mm. to find the true divine. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Yeah. So um, we have two more questions here. One, yeah. uh, first of all, is uh, Atul Singh and he's going uh -huh. to ask the question, and then uh, um, uh, Sol Solange Bertolotto Schneider, who's a Jungian analyst yes, in uh, Brazil. Yes, is from the Punjab. I, I'm not from the Punjab, but uh, it's a very huge, divided uh, um, province of India. Yeah, Atul, I, I don't see you, but I guess I can hear you, so. Okay. Yes, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, Atul here. Uh, first of all, thanks to Skip for inviting me for this webinar. And secondly, thank you, Anne, for sharing your thoughts on this topic. So the question is, um, like, uh, what are your thoughts from the last 20 years, like from the 2001 till today, uh, what is happening in present situation and what you feel like after 10 years or 20 years, what is the future? Um, also, also still a little bit away from the topic, but Huxley was there. He predicted very correctly in his, in his book, Brave World, Bla Brave New World, and also to Orwell, 1984. Oh, yes. yes, yes, So yes. Oh, my when God. we say we can't, we don't know, I mean, yes, yes. we should not predict, like we should not predict or we yeah. should not tell about the future, but that is not correct. It, it can be worked out. I mean, we can do something. And th I mean, third point, uh, you both mentioned about uh, like Bhagavad Gita and uh, dialogue of Arjuna uh, and Lord Krishna. It is about karma. So, uh, mm -hmm. like for, yeah. uh, coming to the spiritual side, yeah. right now, like it is, it is like a robotics. We are in a robotic lifestyle. We, there is no freedom. Like what is happening right now? We don't have freedom, and we are becoming robots. So, what what is the solution for that? Thank you. Um, there, there isn't a solution. That's why I was saying earlier. We're in the post-human age. It's already been called that, and that's that is that is. Uh, I'm afraid a prediction that is not only going to come true. It's already with us. Um, so, uh, I, I I don't make predictions. For instance, uh, so many of my colleagues are talking about. Um, you know, what's the impact of the virus going to be in this way and that way? Are we going to change completely as people? I, I, I don't try and do things like that because uh, I, I really have no idea how it's going, to, it's going to have a big, we know, financial impact. And that matters. I mean, all these things matter. Um, so I'm losing my thread a bit because you asked so many things in one go. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Uh, so okay. First should... question. Yeah. 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 Question yeah. one about from the last twenty years and and oh, future yeah. ten years. Yeah. Um, well, two thousand and one. I mean, what can one say about it? That it, it, it was the most horrifying uh, opening to the century. Uh, it had echoes of um, what happened in the, you know, the dawn of the 20th century. We had two major disasters. One was the Titanic and what that symbolized. I mean, there's the actual event of the Titanic, but also what, uh, you know, the hubris, if you like, that that, that, that symbolized. 
And then, of course, the First World War, which completely changed um, life in the West, certainly, um, it, hugely, hugely, in, in all kinds of ways. War is the father of all things, uh, Heraclitus, as you know. Um, and Heraclitus was one of, uh, perhaps, the favorite Greek philosopher for, for Jung. Um, and that was one of his most famous sayings. And Jung sa himself says, all, um, all, how does he put that? All new life is paid for in blood. So, you know, that the 21st century was certainly paid for in blood and what, what happened in 9-11. Yeah. I, I, I was actually asked by the, uh, just a personal experience, I'm sure we all have personal experiences to do with 2001. I was asked by the IAP to come to New York on an IAP mission in September 2001. Well, we know what happened on, uh, you know, on uh, the 11th of September that year. Mm -hmm. And so I had to defer the uh, work trip to October when I came to New York and had meetings with uh, uh, various representatives of, uh, you know, the New York um, Association. And everybody, I've never experienced New York like that before since I go to New York every year, at least once a year. Um, everyone was so traumatized that the meetings were almost impossible. So okay. we then had to fly. I was with a colleague. Uh, we, we do these trips with two people always because we, we have to you know meet with a lot of people. We have to go to a lot of meetings and we have to write big reports on them for the IAP. So I then had to fly to Los Angeles and we thought at least we're getting away from this. You know, we went down to what was called Ground Zero. We actually looked mm. at that ourselves. Mm. Uh, and that was just... You can imagine, uh, those of you who, who went there don't have to imagine if they know, they, they saw for themselves. I mean, the smoke was still coming up, up from the ground. And this was, you know, in October, six weeks, nearly six weeks later. Yeah. Um, yeah. They, we thought that was going to change life completely. Yeah, fear, like fear, to, to bring the fear, like what is happening right now in the lockdown as well. Yeah, that from I agree. COVID. Yeah. I agree. I think the epidemic we're suffering from is an epidemic of fear. Uh, yeah. what, what happens is that what humans, if we go back to what we were saying earlier, what humans, the thing they fear most is anything they cannot control. And we yeah. can't control nature. And mm. over and over again, we've shown that. And every time it happens, it traumatizes human beings because that yeah. is the biggest fear. Uh, yeah, and uh, from the fear, the next stage is to control. Like yeah. if a person is fearful, like animals or something, then we can control them. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. we can't control. And that that's happening right now, like lockdown. Yeah. Like lockdown, like you that's are, right. and, and uh, like a financial, you know, situation, uh, you are business, closing the business. So that's the reason right, rights are happening. So it is all pre-planned. What I'm focusing now, it's all pre-planned. What is happening right now? Yes, yes, that I'm completely in agreement. I think that the epidemic is an epidemic of fear. Yes. Because human beings cannot, they, the anxiety is that you know, anything that cannot be controlled is, well, it's godlike, isn't it? Uh, I, mm. I made a study of um, Amazonian myths at one time. And mm -hmm. Their myths are wonderful because what they do is they, they, they it's when I was very close to Levi Strauss, who was one of the great anthropologists of the 20th century. And Levi Strauss spent a long time in Amazonia. That was about all the field work he ever did, this, but he, he did spend some time in Amazonia. He collected about 350 myths from different Amazonian tribe groups that he's, he's lived with for a while. And mm. what they're showing is that initially animals had fire. Uh, animals could cook their food, could keep warm, could have lights and so on. 
And then mm. humans came along and stole the fire from the animals, very similar to the, the founding myth of, uh, one of the founding myths of Western thinking, of course, you know, Prometheus and mm -hmm. Yes, and, yes. and so for the Amazonian tribal groups, they equate nature and the gods, you know, they, mm. they see them as one, one realm, and they see yes. humans as a completely separate realm, and that humans are up against animals, but they're also up against the gods, because, yes. <laughs> so those were very, very interesting, because they, you know, they're showing, you know, basically humans took back a lot of control from nature and from the gods, which we've done, haven't we, through science. Um, yes. uh, but we cannot totally control nature, nor can we, you know, and the nature and the divine come together there. We can't control those ultimately. And that yeah. causes... Uh, after all, I think you, I think you probably made your point. Um, I can, and I certainly don't make projections of the future, but I take your point that some of the um, uh, the Hindu myths do that. But well, you're Sikh, are you? If you've got a name like Singh. Uh, no, no, I'm Hindu. You're Hindu. But, uh, I, I'm, yeah, a, yeah, yeah. I'm a Catholic Hindu. <laughs> okay, very good. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. Very so uh, let, let's. Thanks go a lot. On. Thanks a lot. For Thank, the you, Thank you. Let's let's go on to Solange's question here. Um, Solange is a union analyst in uh, Sao Paulo, and, oh, hello. Oh. and hello. is also an I author. Because I, I go to Brazil quite often. Yeah, is also an author, and she said, "What do you think about the expression making soul used by many Jungian psychologists?" Oh boy. <laughs> Yeah, I remember having long conversations with James Silman about that. And I used to say to him, I really can't bear that word, that expression of yours. What, what on earth do you mean? Um, uh, he, he did explain, and I, I, you probably know this better than I do, Solange. Uh, I do actually come to Brazil quite often. I, I can't place you, so I don't know if we've met. But um, I come to Rio mostly, but I've been in Sao Paulo, of course, as well, and, and also various other parts of Brazil. Um, and that's why I was mentioning the, because Levi Strauss got his uh, myths, of course, from Brazilian Amazonia, not, you know, not from other parts of Amazonia. Um, I, I don't know, you probably know better than I do. I did have, I did ask James, uh, what, what on earth did he mean? Because he would do, give talks on making soul in the university, for instance. And I, that for me sounded like a travesty of both you know, soul and university life. Um, but he actually gave me quite a good explanation. I can't remember what the heck it is now, but maybe one of you knows that better than I do. It's not my kind of language, really. Uh, maybe, but do you have some thoughts about that? Maybe you'd like to share that with us. Well, uh, it's an expression that disturbs me a lot because I can't imagine uh, that we can make so. Yeah, but uh, I was thinking about uh, Jungian became a brand, a yeah. marketing oh, brand. Oh, right, 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 right. And some expressions are very popular, especially here in Brazil. Yeah. Uh, like uh, Jungian psychology could be consumed by people. And uh, as, uh, as a competition, uh, I am making so then I am better analyst than you. Mm -hmm. And a kind of uh, false uh, promises of uh, uh, turning someone in a more divine person. I'm very disturbed with this expression. This is very common in many conversations with Jungian, um, self-called Jungian. Yeah, right. Uh, what I'd suggest is uh, have a look at what James writes about that, because he, I, I, J James Tillman and I used to rather tiptoe around each other because we come from very different um, psychological backgrounds. You know, he's archetype, I, I, I mean, I'm very archetypal, as myself, but James 
of course, archetypal psychology was Jane's creation. Um, and he writes a lot about that. And uh, so does Guy Grigg, who I'm very close to. Um, and but what they, I think I don't is think, the expression I don't is not being used as Jane's human. I, uh, I agree with you. I think what you're saying is very, really interesting. Thank you. I, I, I'll make a note of that point because, as you say, it's turning it Jung, Jungian psychology into a brand. Yeah, that we manufacture and we can yeah. sell almost like. Um, you know, the priests, this is what brought about the Protestant Revolution, of course, wasn't it? The priests selling um, uh, pardons and so on to, you know, to the congregation, weren't they? And making a lot of money out of that. And that's why there was the split in the Christian, huge split in the Christian church. Um, because they were, they turning Christianity into a brand where they could sell, you know, pardons and um, all kinds of things. So you, 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 probably some of you are practicing Protestants and know. I mean, I'm great. I have great admiration and respect for Luther, enormous amount. Um, but that's exactly what he was protesting against, wasn't it? In the church, in the Catholic Church, he's saying it's you know what you're saying. He wouldn't have used exactly the same words. But he's saying you're turning this into a brand. You're making money out of it. Mm. And that is not what religion should be about. And this is not what psychoanalysis should be about. I don't think James and Wolfgang, Wolfgang Giegwick mean that at all, but that's what it can sound like. Yeah, manufacturing souls well, to sell. Yeah. Because uh, Indian psychology is so deep, so profound. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. I would like to thank you for... Uh, Yes. for the conversation today because oh. sometimes Jungian psychology becomes so superficial in yeah. some Jungian groups that I, I feel so... Oh boy, how right you are. <laughs> yeah. uh, grateful for the, coming back to the origins of the deepness of Jungian psychology. I, Thank you I, very may, much. may I ask you, Solange, are you H-A-B or are you, are you S-B-R-P-A? Uh, nothing. I am oh, uh, T.J. Right. Jung Institute in Zurich. Yes, I I'm, did my my right. studies there, and I just belonged there. Yeah. Okay. Because I'm, I'm, you know, I've, I've lectured quite a bit at different parts of, certainly at the SBRPA in Sao Paulo, and at the university there. And also, I'm very close with the AJB founders. You know, the Bosha. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Walter and uh, Walter Boucher. Yes, yes, Walter Boucher and, and, and his wonderful wife. Um, yes, I agree. It's being, this is actually what you're saying. May I just say, can I go on, Skip? Is that right? Yes, just yes please. Because Solange is raising a hugely important point. This is what we were saying when. Um, the developing groups but that the IAP set in motion quite a while ago are on the whole you know, a very positive move because it's taking um, analytical psychology into parts of the world where there are no training institutions or, or any you know, formal way of disseminating analytical psychology. But when the developing groups started, um, it, I, I began to have question marks about them because um, it felt, as somebody put it, actually not myself, but it was, they said it was a bit like a sausage making machine, you know, just churning out um, half trained people, you know, and then they qualify as Jungian analysts. Mm -hmm. And, and that is the worrying development. I mean, I'm not saying all the developing groups are doing that, but there's a certain element of that, you know, as you say, it, it's turning into a brand, where it's, it's the kind of mass producing so-called analysts. And the level then begins, you know, the, the, the level of um, practice begins to get a bit, um, well, maybe not quite what it should be. It's 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 uh, it's the shadow side, if you like, of spreading. You know, anything that becomes global is always in danger of turning into a global brand, and that applies to psychoanalysis as much as it does to anything else. I'm afraid there's always that that shadow side to to that. 
I, I have a main concern about the uh, God as uh, money being the God. Yeah. And sometimes I believe money is being the God of the younger institutions around the world as well, because they need to survive, they need to have yeah. students, yeah. and sometimes they accept many students just because they can pay for yes. the training, yes, and for the um, analysis, and so, uh, many, many hours of analysis and supervision. And I think that's a big problem. Uh, because it's a kind of a shadow and corruption in, inside the institutes because they need to survive. I'm, I'm afraid of what you're putting your finger on there is that um, any movement that starts off, you know, it starts off quite small. It may be one per, often. I mean, the other great thing about what Jung stood for, which I'm absolutely 100% with him on, is individual creativity. So any movement starts with an individual or a few individuals. And then if it takes off, it starts to become a movement and it's, it becomes, you know, it goes into the collective. And as it disseminates wider and wider, uh, it begins to get diluted by all, you know, in all kinds of ways. The, 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 I'm afraid this is a kind of universal and archetypal, if you like, um, way that every movement seems to go. Yeah. And that's why, over and over again, I think Jung is coming back to the individual, isn't he? I think he's very aware that, you know, his, his psychology is beginning to kind of spread everywhere. And he feels that what he stood for is he's not reckoning. He, he was very against all these training institutions. He didn't want to have trainings. He, he, he felt that it should always be an individual experience. I think something that you were talking about, Skip, there earlier, um, that Edinger was talking about. I, I, by the way, I liked Edinger very much. I never met him, but we did have a small communication at one point, and it was a very mm -hmm. nice letter from him. Um, but this, uh, this is an archetypal phenomenon, actually, that you're touching on here. You know, it happens to every... Create, creative act, you know, an individual will come up with some wonderful, like Jung did, like Freud did. Freud actually wanted that. Freud wanted to create a, a, a global brand, if you like. You know, he really wanted that. Yeah, but the last place he wanted it to happen was the United States. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't want it to go there. Um, and that's exactly where it took off. <laughs> you know? uh, Jung, Jung loved the United States, and he was very happy. You know, that he was always coming, as you know, all know, to the United States, um, different parts of the United States. Yes, am I going over time? Well, no, no it, it's ah. not a question of that. We have all the time that you have. Uh, but, but I just wanted to say that we're very gracious for your time. Uh, let me just observe something about my work and what I've been trying to do for the last 10 years. Um, I um, never really had much interest in uh, clinical psychology per se. Uh, and what happened to me was that Dr. Jung basically served as my um, first Joseph Campbell, but then Dr. Jung served as my guru over many years. And I've been through plenty of traumas, which we don't need to discuss. But one of my concerns had been that um, Dr. Jung's perspectives hadn't really gotten out of the so-called Jungian container. I mean, even today, most of, of the works that come out are for a very closed group of Jungian analysts. All the Jungian analysts will read the work, but nobody else reads it or comes close to understanding it. Um, I played with it uh, around the edges during the 1990s and um, finally, <laughs> when I started to read the work directly, I found out that it wasn't really about clinical psychology at all, which is what it, the reason that I was put off by it. I mean, I was interested in the works around the, his study, 
but I was afraid of going into his work because I thought it was about clinical psychology and uh, I didn't want, I wasn't interested in clinical psychology per se, because I think the world needs a lot more information than it currently has. And I'm very concerned that uh, the archetypal events that we see go on, especially in the early 21st century, have been very largely for a lack of uh, human understanding about some of the things that Jung talked about, but uh, hadn't really escaped the, the container of the Jungian community per se. And uh, so anyway, I started a website in 2010 called Archetype in Action, uh, where I wrote hundreds of essays, nobody read them, <laughs> and, and I published many other essays and never got any interaction. So it was uh, only when I started doing the YouTube channel uh, that I started to get interaction from people and started to get people to engage with, um, with me and with uh, what I'm trying to do, which is to uh, well, I, my, my archetype is Johnny Appleseed. I want to plant seeds around the world. Mm -hmm. And um, as, as you know, we have uh, at least uh, three different, four different uh, uh, continents represented just in this group, because in addition to the ones that you can see, there are also currently 13 people watching on YouTube, uh, mm -hmm. some, some in India. Uh, so this is a, a seed planting exercise from my perspective. Um, but uh, Brendan has one more question. And then in fairness, I think we ought to offer you the chance to call an end to this. We do have a, a custom at the end to um, do a uh, Sanskrit mantra uh, for happiness in the world. And... Uh, Kushbu Kantaria, who's my partner on the Bhagavad Gita reading, uh, is observing on YouTube, but uh, is, is not here uh, in the group at the moment. So I will do my rendition of that if you don't mind. But uh, Brendan, uh, go ahead and ask your question. Well, you mentioned, Anne, that you were a Catholic Hindu. And that uh, pricked my conscience because, uh, or my memory, because I was in, I don't know if you know Satchidananda Asaram in uh, Trichy. I was there with uh, Dom Bede Griffiths about 30 years ago, and I wonder whether you think he's worth a second look, but you don't know that name, Bede Griffiths. I don't, I don't actually. No, okay. the, the, I, I know Griffiths is a familiar name, but not in that context, no. Um, no, I'm not, uh, I mean, ashrams, and I don't think I've ever actually been to an ashram, but I, I, I'm, I come actually from an old colonial family, so I'm, you know, the, that background. Uh, but I grew up, you know, speaking Hindi fluently, which is almost all gone because I don't have any opportunity to use it anymore, and also on um, Hindu texts. Um, and so, and, and of course, every year we would have in Bombay, because our version of Ganesha is Ganpati. And so we would have uh, the Ganpati festival every year, which was wonderful. Um, so, you know, and, and it all, I mean, my, you know, my, I'm, <laughs> I am uh, psychologically and by birth part Hindu. That is very much my formation. But I'm also British, because I come from a British colonial background. Mm -hmm. um, and so many of us who come out of our colonial families, you know, we, we are both. We've integrated both, you know, both the colonizer, but also the colonized. And so we're both, I'm both British and Hindu. That's just always been part of me. 
and I think you were responsible for the uh, resurgence in the interest in Indian uh, philosophy in the 80s, the Ananda Marg movement and all the rest. Oh, how wonderful. I, I love to think I were, but I'm not sure. Can I just say, I, I love to think I was, but I don't think I, I was. I, I did spend quite a lot of, I think it was the earlier than that, when, um, when a lot of my fellow Indians had to leave um, Uganda um, you know, I, I, I remember spending hours driving back and forth, you know, to the airport to collect a lot of my fellow Indians and, and take yes. them to shelters. Um, I wanted to actually take up something that Skip was saying about Jungian analysts all being so au okay fait with Jung's writings. It's not the case at all. The ones who really know Jung, you know, the collected works and, and everything else Jung's published are the Jungian academics. Um, because we, I've been saying this ever since I trained, uh, that we don't get much Jung in our training. I mean, particularly in London, we get a lot of classical Freud, contemporary Freud, Klein, Neo-Kleinian, Bionian, and a smattering of Jung, but most of us are very badly read in the collected works. And that's when I started writing, I had to actually read the collected works. Um, once I was an analyst uh, to be able to write about Jung, because we we get it's most extraordinary around the world. What, what I eventually suggested, and I wonder if any of you who are connected with trainings around the world, was that the way we could teach Jung best is to actually link it to clinical experience, because we're you know that's what we're being trained to do is to work as clinicians to take. Um, pathology that we find in our in our you know in our consulting rooms link it to something in Jung because after all he's a psychiatrist as well as a practicing analyst and to take something from the collected works and then that fleshes it out but you know we, we're actually very badly read in Jung most of us analysts because we you know it's just missing from the curriculum <laughs> we get everything else but hardly any Jung Quite and the academics, they started in the 90s. I mean, I obviously I work in academia as well. But when the academics started, they're going through the collected works with a microscope. So they're very well read in all the collected works. Everything Jung ever wrote is you know, known to the, you know, Sonia Sham Dasani you knows Jung back, back before. He's not a clinician. Um, there are many academics. I'm working with one in America at the moment, Daniel Burston, who maybe is known to some of you. Um, I mean, he's not a clinician, but my goodness, does he know his Jung? Does he know his Freud? Does he know his Lacan? Much mm -hmm. better probably than any uh, you know, mainstream psychoanalyst, much better than any Lacanian practitioners, and much better than most Jungian practitioners. It's really <laughs> extraordinary, don't you think? Yes. You know, collected works are sort of a Bible, if you like, for, you know, the um, Jungian analysts, but they don't know it. it Maybe like most Christians don't know the Bible. Yeah, the interesting, <laughs> the, the interesting thing that I've discovered yeah. is that there's almost no teaching of Jung in academia. No, um, no, I, that's where I, Peterson is so useful. And and so there, that's why I decided to start giving classes or yeah. essentially classes and advanced classes. We have an advanced reading group mm -hmm. where, where we've been through Ion and uh, mm -hmm. Mysterium. Um, yep. 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 But, uh, but I, I tried to get some local college or university and I live in the Washington area. There are 50 colleges and universities yeah. around. Yeah. I tried to offer adjunct courses in right. Jungian psychology, and I was uh, sim simply put down. Well, you know why? I mean, he, there are various reasons why he is, he's so far been shunned in the academy because of his, you know, pro so called pro Nazi stance, um, and also because he's seen as a mystic. Uh, but this is where Jordan Peterson is very useful indeed. He is bringing Jung slap bang into the academy. It's great stuff, actually. Uh, I must wind down. I've got a family call coming through about half four from uh, it's it's quarter past four in London at, at the moment. I don't know, you're in different parts of the world, so you're on yes. different time zones. So if you if you allow me to say um, thank you so much for you know you've been really 
very good to interact with. I hope some of what I said made sense. I, I'm such a chatterbox. Very, very <laughs> helpful, and and we very very much appreciate your being here today. Mm -hmm. And, and thank, yes, you so thank, much. You, thank yes, you so thank much. Thank you so for, much. It's really been great. Um, thank you so much. And, and, and yes, and especially those last questions you were asking, Ben. Yeah. But thank you, Skip. It's been such a pleasure to meet you at last. I'd actually like to interview you. I want to know how a lieutenant colonel from the Marines becomes a Jungian. Wow. That is. Well, you, you, can, you, you may definitely interview me. <laughs> I will. I, I'll do that one day. Thank you. Okay. All right. Bye, Bye everyone. For sure. I need to go too. So uh, thanks Bye. everybody for your great ideas and I look forward to more. Thank you all for coming. And uh, for those who wish to stay for a benediction and uh, you know, please uh, feel free to do so. Um, and um, I will, uh, I'll share that with you now. It, 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 did anybody else want to say something before we close out for today. It's been a long session, but it's been a good session. And I, especially considering the hour that we began, we couldn't get anyone really from the West Coast. <laughs> but um, anyway, all right. So um, I'm going to share this mantra with you. And um, I, this is a prayer for the happiness of the world and the happiness for all of the worlds. And here's how it goes. Om. Nice to see you. Leonard wrote to me, write to me. Uh,